Don Bosco's kind, fatherly manner in dealing with the oratory boys was the exact opposite of the severe approach to discipline that was popular at the time. Often, he went well out of his way to help souls he barely even knew. However, he did also know how to put the fear of God into people, how to chastise those who severely needed it. I'll be telling two stories today that illustrate both sides of this incredible man. He was a multifaceted diamond of sanctity, showing both mercy and justice. You're watching The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Don Bosco gave all his time to the oratory boys on Sundays, holy days, and even weekdays. With the rector's approval for them, he sacrificed the time reserved for his daily walk or some other period. He went everywhere, into public squares, streets, and workshops to invite youthful workers to the oratory. On Sundays, these worker boys were left all alone and were wont to fritter away their meager wages on amusements. Don Bosco knew from experience that this laxity could lead to much evil and cause even the good to stray and become a danger of scandal to others. He particularly sought youngsters who, coming from afar, didn't know what church to attend and had no friends. Whenever he found that one of his boys was unemployed or was working under a harsh master, he quickly found him either a different occupation or a better employer. Not content with these efforts, Don Bosco went almost daily to visit the boys in stores, in factories, or at construction sites. He always had a kind word, a question, a sign of affection, or a small gift for them, leaving them filled with indescribable joy. At last, someone cares for us, the boys exclaimed. One day, near the city palace, Don Bosco met with a young man from his oratory who was returning from shopping. The young man was carrying a glass of vinegar, a bottle of oil, and other supplies. The little fellow upon seeing Don Bosco started jumping for joy and shouting, Long live Don Bosco! He put the oil bottle under his arm and shouted again, Viva Don Bosco! Then he clapped his hands. But he dropped the bottle, and then he dropped all he was carrying, and the glass containers broke on the ground. At the noise, the boy remained stunned for a moment, and then he began to cry, saying that when he returned home, his mother would whip him. Don Bosco kindly led the boy, still weeping, into a shop. He told the shop's mistress the story and begged her to replace what the young man had lost. Then the mistress asked, And who are you? I'm Don Bosco, he introduced himself. The good woman smiled, took a glass and a bottle, poured the vinegar and oil, and handed them to the young man. What do I owe you? Don Bosco asked. Twenty-two soldi, but it's paid already, the woman answered kindly. Thus, his friend could return home with the supplies and not get a whipping all through Don Bosco's help. And now, I'll tell a story that shows the other side of Don Bosco. It was very common for whole families to visit him at the oratory. This was because he didn't limit his apostolate to poor, penniless street orphans, but got into the habit of assisting any boy in need of help. Some went to expensive schools and would visit him for help with their Latin studies. These boys would also bring their families with them, so the apostolate extended far beyond just the boys themselves, and he would give excellent advice to all who came, as a good priest should. So that all sets the stage for this story. A young man by the name of Emilio Verniano formed a relationship with Don Bosco. The father, son, daughters, and mother all visited him in the reception hall on Thursdays. That family consisted of eight children, and all were eager to hear the words of Don Bosco. But he was displeased with their lack of modesty in dress. The daughters who were not yet twelve were excusable, but those older than eighteen couldn't be excused for their attire. However, both because bitter reproach was the fashion and because the family was so good and didn't see anything blameworthy about the girls' unmoderated freedom, Don Bosco was unwilling to sternly criticize them immediately. Instead, with the suavity that only can come from the fruit of sanctity, 
he waited for the opportune moment. One day, the household came to converse with him. He was talking, and one of the daughters stood before him, listening, and the other stood with her mouth open. Suddenly, Don Bosco turned to her and said, Can you explain something to me? Well, yes, she said delightedly. Tell me, why do you despise your arms so? He asked. I, I don't despise them, she replied. Yet it seems to me that you do, he observed. Oh, far from it, the mother said. Often I have to scold her for being so vain. She's always washing her arms and then perfumes them with fragrant water. Yet I tell you, Don Bosco addressed the little one directly, that you despise your arms. Why, she asked, how? Because when you die, I pray that you go to heaven, but certainly these arms of yours will be thrown to burn in the fire. Is this not despising them? The girl responded, but I did nothing wrong. I don't want to go to hell. Don Bosco said, it will be at least purgatory, and who knows for how long. But this goes for me also, exclaimed one of the older daughters, blushing, because my neck is uncovered. Well, the flames from the arms will go up the neck and encircle it all, replied Don Bosco. I'm just going to pause the story here and add that Don Bosco wasn't referring to the neck being exposed, but actually a low-cut neckline. All right, back to the story. All right, I get it, concluded the mother. I understand. It's my duty to correct all of this. And she thanked Don Bosco for the warning. It's beautiful to see how prudence and modesty shine in this warning. When Don Bosco became a priest, he didn't shy away from dealing with all kinds of people and their problems. Thus, St. Paul says, I became all things to all men, that I might save all. That's why St. John Bosco was also concerned about his spiritual daughters, who were God's creatures redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, he did so tastefully and respectfully. If you'd like to hear about St. John Bosco's vision of the persecution of the church, please click on the video I've put on the screen. Thank you all for even watching and subscribing to these videos. God bless you and Our Lady keep you.